Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Glenn Peruda uh, from uh, Colorado uh, Children's and uh, National Jewish Health. Uh, he's a professor of uh, pediatrics and uh, leads the pediatric uh, gastrointestinal uh, eosinophilic disorders unit there. Um, published an extraordinary well. And uh, he's going to give us a, a talk on um, uh, diagnosing these kids. Thank you. Thank you, Pratt, and thank you for the invitation and privilege for being here today. It's always great to be at this meeting. It's one of the highlights of my year when I get to come to, to meet with this group. And I'd encourage everyone here to engage with all the speakers. We learn as much from you as hopefully you get from, from the presentations today, and I'd encourage you to come up and engage. It really is one of the special parts of, of this meeting and overall. So I, I wanted to start out by saying just um, – when you think about making a diagnosis of any disease, if you were to say, how do you diagnose a fractured arm? You're in an accident, the arm is disfigured, you may need an x-ray, you may not. It's pretty straightforward. If you have a strep throat or an ear infection, you go in, you have pain in your ear, you may need to get a, an examination, uh, you may need to get a throat culture, and you make the diagnosis. 90% of the time, with most diseases, you can make the diagnosis with a history. You need a physical examination, another 5% of the time, and then it's unusual, but you may need to go on to get further testing. And in this disease, in particular, in this group of diseases, clearly you need to have additional testing, as you've heard about already. And, and part of my job today was to review some of the procedures and tests that are needed to uh, and, and some of the new findings that hopefully will help us to make those uh, diagnoses as time goes on. So I'd like to present to you four topics today, and this will focus primarily on eosinophilic esophagitis. As Dr. Newberry has already mentioned, that, and Dr. Sevis also, that eosinophilic gastritis, colitis, enteritis are certainly rare, more unusual, uh, not as common. So most of the information that we have right now focuses on EOE, but we'd be happy to speak about those uh, at, at breaks or other sessions. In general, whenever you think about an eosinophilic GI disease, it requires several different components to make the diagnosis. You need to have symptoms. You need to have a histo histological abnormalities, as our Dr. Newberry has shown you already, that have increased numbers of the cells that are present. It's easier in the esophagus, as we said, because the esophagus doesn't normally have them, but the rest of your intestinal tract normally has eosinophils, and how you gauge whether it's abnormal number or not is a point of discussion even amongst healthcare professionals and providers. Importantly, you need to exclude the other causes for eosinophils to be there, and Dr. Newbery has mentioned this already, and we'll talk about it briefly as we go on, but we need to make sure that there aren't other reasons that they may be the case. And I put in italics some of the questions that have come up and we were provided before here, but we also think about what is the underlying problem? Why did those eosinophils go there, especially in eosinophilic esophagitis? And I think, uh, was it secondary to food? Fre frequently, yes, and that will be the point of Dr. Spergel's presentation. Are there other causes such as environmental triggers that may have caused it, or is it it's something else that we have yet to discover? This shows a product of your contributions and what AFED has done for the community at large. This was a consensus recommendation that was the second one. The first was published in 2007. This was published in 2011. Identifying uh, the consensus recommendations to help make this diagnosis. And, and while it's, um, it's I, I think, filled with a lot of important details, it really has, I think, set a benchmark for how we make this diagnosis. And I think I included this slide just to show you that it wasn't a few people getting together in a room thinking about something and coming up with it. It was very much a multidisciplinary process of a number of different investigators from a number of different specialties. So who are these patients? And Dr. Sevis touched on this earlier and I wanna just briefly review some of the symptoms that are associated with eosinophilic esophagitis. And as she said, there may be a gradient over time that we see develops depending on your age and the ability to report symptoms. Younger children may have abdominal pain, vomiting, eating problems, symptoms of reflux, very nonspecific. 
Older children and adults have problems with food getting stuck in their esophagus, problems with swallowing, and in some circumstances, chest pain. You may have reflux disease that doesn't get better with traditional kinds of treatments. And as was mentioned, there can be coping behavior that develops, and this is an important area to think about because often patients have developed ways to cope with this. So if you said, do you have problems swallowing? The answer may be no. But if you said, do you chew your food a lot? Do you wash your food down with water? Do you take a long time to eat meals? Do you lubricate your food with gravies or butter? The answer is yes. So it takes a couple of questions to get to that point of really identifying those symptoms, and that's very important. And there can be other symptoms that we don't understand very well. There's a question about talking about research. Repeating search. We're in the search stage still in many of these areas. So what causes limb pains? We certainly hear that, but we don't understand why those things are present yet. There can be malnutrition, can be abdominal pain. These things have yet to be measured completely. Now, you've heard a whole 15 minutes about the histology, and, and it becomes a repetitive theme in many of our presentations. And it's an important thing to think about because it does hold a key diagnostic uh, parameter that we need to consider as we take care of patients certainly for the diagnosis, and as we go forward, also probably for how patients respond to treatments. And if this is especially important in the care of patients as a part of therapies and identifying which therapies are safe as we go on. So as Dr. Newberry had said, increased numbers of eosinophils. There may be other features of inflammation that he had identified to you. When you think about inflammation, it's not always a bad thing. It's something the body does in response to something it encounters. So it may be trauma, it can be infection, it can be an allergic reaction or something else, but that inflammation is the body's process of trying to heal, and when it gets out of control, then we have a disease state. You've seen this already, in which there is the normal esophagus here. It is a smooth surface. As shown here, this is the inside of the esophagus and this is the tissue but all these cells look very uniform, as Dr. Newberry said, are flattened cells. And then in panels B, C, and D, you can see that there are increased numbers of these pinkish cells that are the eosinophils present throughout the tissue, within the surface of the tissue, and sometimes forming these little clusters of tissue, or clusters of eosinophils that can be features that we see with eosinophilic esophagitis, but perhaps in other diseases. Mast cells have been discussed already and are brought up in one of your questions. I show this slide to you because it emphasizes the fact that this, these cells are present throughout the lining. They're also present down here in the lower part. And we are very limited, as Dr. Newbury said, to a very small piece of tissue that doesn't get deeper, where some of these problems with motility or contraction of the esophagus are really occurring. So these cells are probably lower and probably lower in the tissue and probably also are related to some of the things as Dr. Seva showed you with the contraction or the squeezing of this esophagus that may be related to some of the symptoms. We need to exclude other causes for this inflammation. This is a table that was brought to you before and I think it's an important table to look at and, and we consider as healthcare professionals so we're trying to make a diagnosis by excluding other things that may be present. So these are all the different kinds of things that we think about. Again, we go back to our history, we go back to our physical examination to make sure that these things aren't present. I wanted to show you a, a couple of things here. This is a normal endoscopy, and just to let you know what happens when we're in, inside the endoscopy unit, the endoscope is now going down into the esophagus. There is a smooth appearance. You can see these blood vessels that are present that are normal features of the esophagus. And we look all the way down at the lining and then try to target areas that may be abnormal to make a biopsy, and now this is going into the stomach. When we think about and do an endoscopy on a patient who has eosinophilic esophagitis, I think you can see some differences here. It's not as smooth. There are these lines or furrows that are present. There are white patches that are present, and that's the eosinophil pus that may be coming there. And then we go down to the stomach. So those are features of the endoscopy that we look at, and, and you'll see some still pictures of that with Dr. Hirano's presentation. But when we go into the endoscopy unit, you uh, give us the uh, privilege of taking care of your child there and doing these procedures, that's what things look like. 
Now, what else? What's new in this field, and what kinds of things are we thinking about? And this is a list of different things that we are trying to develop to help us understand not only what happens in the esophagus, but are there features that may be specific for this disease that would allow us to have some diagnostic clarity? This is a, uh, a test uh, instrument called the endoflip, and it helps to capture esophageal function. How stiff is that esophagus? How is it with respect to part of its function? And Dr. Hirano has been one of the leaders in developing this, can talk about it more. It's, you can see the balloon here. It fills with the fluid, and it senses movements and the, the way that the, the esophagus is able to stretch and squeeze is shown here in this diagram. And, and perhaps it's able to help us think about motility problems, as are some other kinds of tests. This is a new type of uh, potential diagnostic called spectroscopy, in which you're able to detect eosinophils within the esophagus, not only on that very superficial surface that we look at that I showed you at the time of endoscopy, but perhaps even deeper. So what you can see is a three-dimensional plane of the tissue that maybe you can see a little bit deeper within the esophagus, and it may offer us some benefit in that way. This is work that uh, has been done in collaboration with our colleagues in, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, and I think it's particularly relevant in the context of what Dr. Newberry had said in that we're trying to count the numbers of those cells in the tissue. And you can see here that there these with this specialized stain, this is stained in a traditional way that we would look at under the microscope. This tissue has been stained with an antibody specific for eosinophils and one of the proteins in eosinophils. You can see that the eosinophils are more readily apparent. And to address the exact issue that Dr. Newbery brought up is that sometimes these cells have may already become very angry and released all of their contents. You can't see them as you might have originally. The stain is actually able to pick up all of that protein in the tissue where you may not see an intact cell. So this type of staining and scoring that goes along with it may offer us benefit in helping to understand the tissue and our specific elements of the disease. Biomarkers are genes. Well, these are very commonly used terms. We use them within the medical field. You hear about them when you go to the office. You talk about this on the internet. Well, what are they? They're molecules that are measured in a sample, and those present, the presence of those may reflect the severity or the presence of some physiological or a disease state. And these kinds of measurements can help us to think about diagnosis, picking treatments, response to treatments, likelihood of developing complications. So we can get a lot of information from these, but to date, the only real biomarker that we have that's been used clinically has been the numbers of eosinophils within the tissue. But there's some very important work going on, and Dr. Seves has touched on this already. This is a picture of a microarray analysis, or a, an array of genes, thousands of genes that are present within the body. Again, this is work that has been supported by AppFed, and, and I show it to you only to say that when you look at the yellow, this can be a gene that's normal. You look at uh, the red, this is a gene that's increased, and when you look at the blue, these are genes that are decreased, and these are four different patient groups. So normal, GERD, or reflux disease, eosinophilic esophagitis, and then patients that were responding to a certain type of treatment, flutigazone. So here is a way to figure out, geez, are these patients who we can take care of in a certain way and not another way? Is, and this may help us in not only understanding treatment response, but also with diagnoses. So these are some of the cutting edge work that's being done in Cincinnati and in collaboration with a number of different investigators. And then this is a test that we've been developing in Colorado and with our colleagues in Chicago uh, to look at a way to address uh, the, uh, the need for endoscopy and making the diagnosis and following treatment. So we thought about the fact that could you in fact measure inflammation within the lumen of the esophagus or the hole itself without having to do an endoscopy. And we took advantage of an old test. So this is a, called an entero test. It's a capsule filled with a string. When you swallow this capsule, the string dislodges and ends up in your small intestine. And the original idea behind this was that the lower part of that string that was in your small intestine could be pulled out and sampled. The mucus could be sampled to test for parasitic infections. That's what this was originally designed for, was to test for parasites in your intestinal tract. 
Well, what we wondered was whether the t part of that string that was in your esophagus could sample some of the contents there and look for inflammation. So here's another diagram just showing the string going through the esophagus. It's here in the small intestine, but does this part of the string capture eosinophils in a way that we could try to understand whether any of this inflammation was present or not? Now here's an electron micrographic view of the eosinophil. You can see these little areas here are those granules that have been mentioned before, but you can see them a little bit more distinctly here. And what we did was we put, had patients swallow the string, we left it in overnight, and then when we pulled it out, we sampled the string for these proteins that were present in the esophagus to see if we could measure inflammation and match that with the amount of protein that was in the biopsy. And this is what we found in just one slide, and I'll be happy to discuss this more with you, but this is on the y-axis here shows the amount of protein present, the amount of these, this protein present within the eosinophil itself. This is uh, the samples that were procured from patients who had active eosinophilic esophagitis and patients that did not have inflammation. And what you can see is there is an increased amount of this granule protein present in patients who have active inflammation compared to those who don't. So this suggests that we can capture those proteins with a minimally invasive test, potentially avoid the use of endoscopy to monitor inflammation over time. It's not a test that's available yet to, under, to differentiate between reflux and eosinophilic esophagitis. We think the utility of this will probably be able to follow patients as they go on through their treatment, and we're continuing our work in that. And, and this is work that's been supported by APFED and your the contributions. We're grateful for that. So to summarize, the diagnosis is made on the basis of symptoms, increased numbers of eosinophils within the tissue itself, in this case, the esophagus, but in other types of eosinophilic GI diseases, the stomach, small intestine, or colon. Again, differentiating that number, per se, is a challenge for all of us still. The endoscopic findings may or may not be present. I include that because there are no what we call pathognomonic or absolutely diagnostic features of this disease yet. You still need to have two things together and exclude all of the other things that may be present. There is much hope as research is addressing patients' need directly. So I think often, you know, we wonder about are the things that are being done in a laboratory with mice or with cells or things like that, are they coming back to you? And I would say yes, there are many things that are being supported that are going on to make a difference, and, and you are helping in that regard. So I thank you for your attention. Again, be happy to answer questions.